Okay, so I have about 200 slides, but 47 videos, so let's start. Um, so I'm Blair McIntyre. I'm a professor at Georgia Tech. I'm currently uh, on leave uh, at Mozilla uh, working on this, WebVR, WebAR, uh, and the future of virtual worlds on the web. So I'm going to rapidly go through four topics, briefly introduce WebVR for those who are not familiar with it, because it's awesome. Talk a little bit about A-Frame, uh, which is a framework to try to make it easy to create WebVR content. Uh, introduce WebAR. WebAR doesn't actually exist yet, but uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about potential thoughts and requirements for how we should be thinking about moving toward uh, a WebAR uh, standard. Uh, and then I'll briefly uh, talk a little bit about Argon, which is uh, an app for iOS and Android that lets you start playing with AR now if you want. Okay, so quickly, so we'll start with VR. So obviously VR is popular and people care about it now because of the rapid growth in devices, right? So we can all kind of access VR in one way or another, even if it's just Google Cardboard. The problem um, that WebVR is trying to solve is essentially friction, right? The, uh, if you're building apps for these devices, you're having to get approval to publish them, you're having to publish them, people are having to download them, uh, you're having to program in things like Unity and so on, which are great. Uh, I've taught a games class for 10 years and we used Unity, it's, it's great, but for the kinds of people who may want to put content on the web, it's really inaccessible. I, I, would, I would assert. Okay, so uh, there's this question of friction. So WebVR is essentially, the way to think about it is trying to do for VR what the web did for the web, what the web did for text and documents and images and so on. So it creates something that's open. Anybody can publish. Anybody can put stuff up. It might be a tiny little page. It might be obnoxious. It might be something that would never be approved. It might just be the equivalent of holiday snaps, right? Uh, people can get at it instantaneously by following a link. You text them. All the stuff that we associate with the web, uh, we want to uh, do for, for VR. So essentially what WebVR is is a set of browser APIs that enable you to do rendering to VR headsets at full frame rate, no latency. It, it walks, talks, breathes, smells like a VR app, but it's running inside a web page. So if you've never tried it, um, uh, you can go and download one of a host of browsers that are currently supporting it in one way or the other. Um, Firefox Nightly, you know, will work on any given day. Um, uh, Edge has support if you, ha I know I'm allowed to say that because I work there now. Um, <laughs> and I've been using it to teach a class for the last month to a bunch of high school kids. So uh, Edge has support uh, for these new MR devices that are coming up, Chromium has support, and so on and so on. Samsung, Oculus have their mobile browsers. Um, and there's a mobile polyfill so you can display stereo VR, web VR content on any phone inside a cardboard using that, okay? So you can go try it. Um, the essentially the cool thing about WebVR is that it, it starts to get at, at this question of that people fantasize about to me, which is the metaverse, right? Like everybody dreams about science fiction, we're going to have this universe where we can go through, but essentially that exists, right? It's called the web. People can put anything up there. There's big things, little things. You can connect between them. WebVR is trying to actually do the metaverse, but at varying scales, varying levels of quality, uh, much like everything else on the web. So the problem, the next problem is, okay, we've got that, but it's actually still kind of a pain in the butt to create content, right? If you've ever programmed in 3JS and JavaScript, there's a lot there to do that's very low level compared to, say, what you might think uh, you need to do if you were using, if you're coming from uh, an Angular world or, or uh, a jQuery world where you can create sort of interactive websites pretty easily. So uh, last year, Mo uh, uh, folks at Mozilla created this thing called A-Frame. And what A-Frame attempts, attempts to do is be a framework to make it easy to create 3D web VR content on the web in a way that feels and acts like other web frameworks. OK, so wow, it's, imagine you can read that. So uh, take a little web page, HTML, load the A-Frame uh, script, and now there's some new, new tags, new web, oh, HTML tags. So we create an A scene, and inside that A scene, we put some things, a box, a cylinder, a sphere, a plane, a skybox, load a model, create some animations, and so on, declaratively in the web page, okay? And so this starts to look and smell and feel more like a website. And the cool thing, from my point of view, is that it works with the rest of the web. 
right? So I can, if I'm a jQuery programmer, go and manipulate the properties on those objects using jQuery, just like I would manipulate the properties on any other web DOM element. So that is essentially, you know, the big idea behind behind A-Frame. To dive just slightly deeper, A-Frame is an any component system. Kronos. Yes, Kronos, correct. All right, and so since we got a very quick uh, but interrupted high-level view of what is uh, Web VR and some of what is Web AR, we'll definitely have him come back and talk. Now we're going to talk um, about and turn it over to the technologies that are driving a lot of this um, from, from the very bottom up. So with that, um, over to the president of the Kronos Group, uh, Mr. Neil Trevitt. Okay, thank you, Damon. So uh, Blair was talking about some very cool higher level. Uh, what Kronos does is open standards, and we focus on the interface between the hardware and the software. So it's kind of the foundational layer on which all those higher levels that Blair was talking about are, are based on. And we're an open standards organization. We do um, things that are relevant to AR graphics, vision processing, compute, increasingly neural network acceleration, and we have a bunch of companies. And if, you're not, if your logo is not there, should be, you'd be very welcome to join. So if you look at the native stack for uh, AR processing at a very simplified level, we can kind of go through this presentation and say, how are we going to bring these, these same capabilities for hardware acceleration onto the web platform? So. We have a number of standards that Kronos are working on that are directly relevant, starting at the left, looking at the cameras coming in, even mobile phones getting increasingly large number of sensors and cameras. They're used for figuring out where the device is, pose tracking, uh, but increasingly also geometric scene reconstruction and semantic scene understanding. So neural net processing beginning to be used to not just understand that there's a plain surface there, but it's a table or a chair, and what should you do with it? Underneath, we have various displays, various input devices that we need to interact with, OpenXR, Vulkan for low latency, high performance graphics, which we'll talk about in just for just a couple of minutes, and then GLTF, which is actually not an API, so it's kind of the exception to the rule. It's a 3D file format. And it's relevant, though, to both AR and VR, because as Blair was saying, you want to have the metaverse. You want to be able to go anywhere, download models, download avatars, download augmentations. You can't afford to have a different format for each app. It doesn't, doesn't work out. GLTF is a format that's been designed specifically for fast transmission, easy processing, so you can download it onto any device. GLTF1 was matched to WebGL1. GLTF2, which sneak peek we're launching on Monday, is API independent because the materials now are using physically based rendering. So you tweak your awesome materials with a few parameters, PBR um, parameters, and you can run it on any underlying API. So watch out for GLTF2. But what, was, what about the APIs, the runtime? So Kronos APIs are being used for VR, and as we know, VR is really just a subset of AR. It's AR without the interesting bits. So you have uh, desktop VR is OpenGL. Uh, mobile VR very often is OpenGL ES, which is the embedded systems version. WebGL is the foundation for all of the 3D you see on the web. And Vulkan is the future for low latency, high performance 3D. But what about all the other stuff? That's what OpenXR is dealing with. So the 3D APIs and OpenXR, they complement each other. OpenXR is dealing with all of the devices and display parameters that a VR runtime has to deal with. So on the left-hand side, we have the industry situation today, which is a fragmented industry before OpenXR, where every application and every engine has to port to every different device and every SDK. Every new device has to integrate into an SDK. So if I have a new hand tracking device, I have to you know, beg HTC and uh, Oculus to integrate, and it becomes a real friction for everyone in the industry. OpenXR defines two interfaces, an application-facing interface, so applications can write once and run everywhere that supports those OpenXR APIs, and a device-facing interface, so devices can self-integrate, and those devices become available to any of those runtimes that support the OpenXR uh, standard. So more apps, more devices running on more uh, runtimes, so uh, everyone gets, gets to win. We're talking about the web here. Web VR is complementary to OpenXR. They don't compete. Um, we think that OpenXR can be an awesome 
native level foundation for some of the integration work that WebVR is going to have to do. WebVR is going to be able to use OpenXR to reach into a lot more runtimes and devices than it can do if it had to do all of that work itself. We have a who's who of the VR industry working on OpenXR. We started in December, a few months ago. These things typically take 12 to 18 months. So it's still in development, but it's not, it's not years away, it's kind of months away. So on the 3D rendering side, WebGL, as you said, it's kind of the foundation. WebGL 1 is the pervasively available version today. If you can read it on the top right there, we're up at 90, high 90s in terms of availability in terms of browsers in the world. WebGL 2 launched uh, formally back at GDC, which is back in March, February, March. It brings all of the 3D functionality that we've been longing for to the browser. It, we really now have desktop class 3D functionality in WebGL 2 in your browser. It's being ramped out right now. It's shipping in Firefox and Chrome, um, desktop and Android, and Edge and Safari are planning to ship soon. So we're already, even though it's a few, just a few months in, we're already up around 50% uh, or 60% um, desktop support. So what, where do we go next for WebGL? It's kind of, to know where you're going next, it's kind of interesting to look where you came from. So WebGL 1 was derived from OpenGL ES 2, because back in 2007 era, we had the fortunate situation that OpenGL ES 2 ran everywhere. Every single device in the known universe ran OpenGL Open ES 2, and that was the foundation for WebGL 1. Now we have WebGL Two, which is based on OpenGL ES3, which also runs everywhere because it ships on both Android and Apple and desktop. Going forward, though, it's a little more complicated. Apple are not shipping beyond the ES3, so we can do compute shaders, which is the big missing thing. We need ES3.1, but it's not shipping on Apple, so we might have to do an optional extension. And even looking further forward, we want to use Vulkan and bring that into the web. So what is Vulkan? Vulkan is this one of the new generation 3D APIs. It's low level, it's explicit. There are three of them. There's Vulkan, which is the cross-platform one, DX12, which is the Microsoft one, and Metal, which is the Apple one. And they're similar in their concepts. An uh, OpenGL driver was a big, thick, multi-million line driver. A Vulkan driver is much thinner and therefore low, la low latency, more predictable for application developers. So low latency, high performance makes it great for uh, virtual reality. So we need, and Vulkan is kind of shipping everywhere. It's shipping on all windows. It's the primary 3D API for Android, a bunch of embedded systems, all the GPU guys now shipping, all the engine guys are supporting it. So no, Vulkan is getting good momentum. We want to bring this into the web, but we can't ship it on Apple. So again, we have an issue. So we're working how to solve that. And we're looking at the intersection of the three new APIs. And we think that we can do a subset of Vulkan that will run everywhere with good performance. And on the shading language side, there's lots of open source tools. So increasingly, you can go from anywhere to anywhere in shading language world. And an open source project with that Vulkan subset and all those tools, we can create a Vulkan portability solution that will run everywhere, uh, potentially including Apple. We're just starting this project, so it's a call for participation. If you're interested in this to help build this, please uh, join us. We'll be doing this in, in the open, so you can um, contribute on GitHub. And that might be an awesome portable API at a native level to lift into the web with both JavaScript and WebAssembly. So that's the, that's the cunning plan. The last one is vision, which is in some ways the most complex and the one that we're furthest away from in bringing into the web. Everything else is kind of close and kind of here now, uh, but accelerated, offloaded vision coming off the CPU onto the GPU or other hardware is not something we've really cracked yet in, in the web. We need to um, because vision else is the real power drain for your battery. Uh, if you don't offload it. So in native land, we have OpenVX, which is a very high-level API. You basically connect, connect Lego blocks together, and each Lego block is a vision node. And increasingly, now, you can also include neural network nodes in that graph. 
and it's up then to the silicon implementer to take that graph and run it the best they can. And because they have the graph definition, they can do some really awesome um, optimization. You don't have to use Vulkan to accelerate your OpenVX nodes, but if you have a GPU, many people will. So the question is, and question marks, so this is something that we don't know yet, and this is an interesting discussion. Um, we could use WebGL next uh, to accelerate uh, those nodes. Do we need uh, a WebVX, um, which is a very simple graph building node that doesn't, need, it doesn't really run at runtime. Once you've constructed the graph, it can run at full speed. Perhaps that would be something that the web would find interesting, uh, perhaps not. So, last slide. So, here we started with our native APIs. What can we do for the web? GLTF is easy because it's a file format. It runs web or native. You don't need to change anything. Vulkan, well, we're working on WebGL next through the Vulkan portability uh, API. OpenXR, we think, will be an awesome native platform for WebVR. The two are very complementary. And then on the vision side, people might just use WebGL next compute shaders, and that might be as far as we need to go. But perhaps we need a WebVX type. API to make vision processing simpler. Okay, thanks. Okay, where was I? All right. Perfect. Thank you, Neil. Uh, and then for those two guys in the back of the audience, uh, Blair is back now to finish up at a high level at what uh, web AR and web VR are, so. Yeah, and you can switch over. It should be on, I don't know. Do you have my things plugged in again? All right, there we go, there we already. Go. Okay, oh, I lost a slide. Okay, so where were we? So I was here, fine. So uh, I'll, I'll try to go through this even more quickly. So essentially, uh, A-Frame is built on top of 3JS, so if you've done any web 3D programming, that's probably the most popular uh, language. It's essentially a scene graph library, okay? So uh, the DOM also is a scene graph. It's a graph of a hierarchical collection of nodes. So uh, in designing A-Frame, we essentially took a, a, a hierarchical node model, an entity component model, meaning every node is an entity, and we attach attributes to it uh, which, are def which are actually components that modify that node in some way. So we could have some geometry, attach a color for the geometry. Um, we could specify things like position, rotation, scale, and so on using nodes. We can also attach nodes to do more complex things like animation. So there's a standard animation component. The cool thing about this, or the thing that makes it really powerful, is not the built-in components, but the fact that you can easily write your own. So it's very terse way of writing your own. Components that you know, have initialization behaviors, have behaviors that run when properties are changed, and then can run each frame. So here in my game, I might have a movement pattern node, right? And that movement pattern might be something that just runs around in a little, little sort of spline path. It might also be something that uh, gets mad and attacks a player, um, and it might be something else. Else if I, uh, that was the last one. Okay, so, so A-Frame comes with a bunch of standard components, but the interesting thing is that there's hundreds of other components that people have written, and essentially any A-Frame uh, uh, sample that I've worked on, I always end up creating little sample components, okay? So there's also, uh, if you're interested in this, there's a registry of curated components uh, to help you sort of find things you might want. Searching on GitHub will find them. And there's sort of cool things. So somebody made a, a leap hand component that you can attach and see, see your hands in WebVR. And so these are just things that you can include a script, JavaScript file, drop in and, and use, okay? So some tools for debugging like an inspector uh, and so on. There's a huge community of people using A-Frame. Um, I'm not gonna go through a ton of things. So there's a, a, a thing called A-Painter, which is kind of like uh, Tilt Brush, but written and open source. There's, uh, you know, people tend to use it for things like journalism applications to put content up there. And I, I won't go through any others because we're, we're short. Um, so, uh, uh, 
if you want to get involved in music, go to aframe.io. Uh, this little, uh, as an example, this little uh, video running in the background is actually uh, the source for it is off, off those URLs at the top, glitch.com slash tilde aframe 5000 is the source. And you can access it if you point your phone at aframe 5000 glitch.me, you'll see that little thing running. Uh, lots of contributors, lots of people in the Slack, uh, and lots and lots of future projects. So aframe has been a, a pretty big success, I think, right now. But where does that, so, so, uh, and it's, it's really made it accessible for non sort of 3D graphics programmers to play with web VR. Um, I'm actually, I sort of mentioned offhand, I'm teaching a class uh, to high school students right now that don't have technical background on VR art and they're playing with A-Frame to create little uh, uh, location-based art exhibits, right? And, and it's, been, it's been really fun. Um, so what about web AR? Well, web AR doesn't exist yet, okay? Google recently released a sample app that's a modified version of Chromium that's a single web view that exposes Tango capabilities into the web view uh, and sort of said, hey, this could be web AR. And it's actually a really good start. And it, it does represent how a lot of us are thinking about where web AR will be, which is an, some form of extension of, of web VR. Um, this is a little, uh, a little demo that I did um, uh, just experimenting with illuminating a scene with uh, the actual sun, sun's position in the world. Um, so the key with uh, web AR though is, is this sort of pure 3D, putting 3D in the world version of AR. How do we, how do we go from, from where we're at to that and what are the problems that are different really than web VR? Okay, so um, like web VR, web AR is being, people are getting excited about the ideas because of all the hardware that's coming out. Whether it's phones, normal phones, tango phones, or the variety of displays real and imagined. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, slow. Um, so the challenge here is, in my mind, of AR is similar to VR, which is displaying 3D graphics real time. So WebVR handles that. The other problem, though, is that to do AR, you can only display things relative to what you know about the world. It might be a map, uh, an image that we're tracking off of. It might be a Skittle that you can detect on a game board. Um, Whatever these things are, that's what you can use as the basis for um, AR. So that was actually a demo we made in 2009. So we've been able to do AR in the web in a really kind of poor way for a while, right? You can access WebRTC, run a JavaScript tracking library like, like JSAR Toolkit. So here, this is stuff that Jerome Etienne's been doing recently, uh, integrating that with 3JS and A-Frame. And it's fine, but it's really not enough, right? It's not where, what we need to do to get to the point where AR is really possible on the web in a really webby way. And the problem is that there's very little world knowledge available to an app like that. You're getting video, but you're not getting much other sensors. And if you're relying on the JavaScript that you have access to to run sensing inside your web page, that's never going to going to get you where you need to go, right? And the app becomes tightly coupled to the platform. You might think, oh, that's decoupled because it's just a camera. But if you're sucking in video from the camera, displaying it in a texture, you run it on a HoloLens, you're, you're sort of dead in the water because now you're displaying video on the screen of your HoloLens, which is not what you want to do, okay? So if you step back and think about what is the web, what has WebVR done, the real thing it's done is provide this sort of platform independent way to help developers build apps that are decoupled from the underlying platform, that are responsive to what you're running on. In WebVR, it's sort of this transition from screen to tablet to phone to daydream or whatever onto Vive. In AR, it's actually more complicated, right? So we have marker tracking, but many platforms now are starting to introduce SLAM capabilities, right? So this is from Google I.O. last year, actually. Um, and so here they're, you know, integrating um, uh, generating a mesh on the fly and then using it to, to both track and, and hide that cat when it runs behind the thing. Um, but, and if we, so we could build that and that's what Google essentially did with their, their web AR demo is expose that kind of technology into a web view. But the way they did it was hand you the texture and then you render the video texture uh, on the screen, much like other apps. That's not going to work when you start thinking about see-through displays. So the diversity of technology, both sensing and display makes web AR in some ways a harder nut to crack. Okay, so I think I, 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 both for time and, and just to allow discussion, I'll just, I won't go too much into depth on this, but the key thing I think you want to think about is, is this decoupling. In the web, we want to have platform independent code, platform independent code, 
And so for AR, what does that mean? Well, it means decoupling the representation, rendering, processing, reasoning of reality from the app so that I can run it in different places, I can take advantage of different underlying platform technologies. I could do things like create a WebVX and do processing on different platforms down, at, down in the native part of the browser. A final bit that, that I want people to think about is also the notion of privacy. If I've decoupled the reality from the browser and it's rendering inside the browser, not in the app, now you as a user could go to a website, it could run on Tango, Tango could be tracking, Tango could be displaying video, Tango could be displaying the depth map, but the app may not have access to it, right? So you can actually start accessing web content without throwing your privacy away. Have you, I mean, most people haven't thought about the fact that every app you download for HoloLens has full access to a full textured 3D model of your house if you're running it in your house, right? And is that really what we want, right? Is that where we want to go? So I think web AR may simply extend web VR um, did my laptop fall asleep? <laughs> Let me log it back up. Sorry, I'm running off the laptop so that I don't uh, get trashed by the wireless, but my laptop fell asleep, so we'll see if this comes back. Woo. Okay, come on, you can do it. Um, okay. <laughs> Just a sec. We'll just reload. Come on, please don't do this to me. This is what you get when you do a live demo. <laughs> uh, I'm just stupid. Um, oh, God, what did I just do? <laughs> oh, you're going to get a different demo. OK, so this is actually a really cool demo. Um, this is uh, a demo of the demo that was eliminating the objects using the sun as it naturally sits here. So that wasn't what I wanted. Sorry about that. I'll go back here. Um, Sorry. <laughs> you can do it. You can do it. A there we go. The crash for the live demo that worked. That's impressive. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so um, now we're back. So WebVR will extend, I think, and, and it's not just me. So Google believes this. I, I think the folks at Google, Microsoft, Samsung, uh, and other people who are involved in the WebVR work are all sort of engaged in discussions about how do we extend WebVR to sort of support AR, and, and this makes sense, right? Because we don't want two standards. We want to write apps that can, can live in this sort of XR world. So if this is a browser with some web views, web VR is essentially uh, some implementation in the core that makes it possible to efficiently create uh, 3D that runs at high performance. If you've not tried web VR, you really have to. It's amazing. Um, uh, and essentially, if we start thinking about AR and we think about this decoupling of reality, we could get to this kind of model where we've got something inside that's rendering a representation of reality. It might be local live reality. It might be streaming video. It might be something else. Uh, and we can uh, leverage it and lay it. And the web views themselves do not need to have access to this. And we have all kinds of opportunities for, for efficiency and performance. There's a tiny little box I added up there um, which says that, you know, we can also potentially do vision processing and, and integrate into the, the web views as well. So that's sort of the, this vision of, of AR that folks in the web VR community are thinking about. How can we extend this? Google, like I said, has released something uh, as a demo of this. If you have a Tango phone, go search for it. It's really cool. Give it a, a test. Um, and uh, all of us in this community, uh, Mozilla, Google, Microsoft, are moving forward and experimenting with, with how we would do this. Neil already talked about some of the technology, technology issues that we, we have. So the last bit I just want to briefly talk about is uh, how you can start playing with this now. So I've been working on an a AR-based uh, browser for, God, since 2009. We're on version 4 uh, of, of uh, the Argon browser. It's essentially a browser for iOS. Uh, and finally, as of Monday, Android, uh, that has uh, PTC's Vuforia embedded in it. So you can do um, uh, some vision tracking, but also uh, integrates uh, well with the web. Now, Argon is based as a browser. The real sort of uh, interesting part about it for the long term is the JavaScript framework. Um, uh, Building an app with Argon JS will run on the Argon browser. It'll also run on in other browsers depending on what their capabilities are. We're actually going to make it support in the next week or two the Tango thing that Google has released. Uh, we're working on WebRTC support finally because people seem to want to do uh, WebRTC and 
uh, JSR Toolkit. So it's all available. It's all open source. You can go and uh, uh, the browser we actually just open source as well. So if you want to help us uh, expand it, I've already made this painfully obvious. But this is running in this presentation is running in Argon. Um, and uh, using Reveal.js, a standard framework. And this is, you know, it's an AR browser. So we can put little spinny A-frame cubes around us in the room. Really exciting. Wave. Yes, very nice. I know cubes are exciting. Um, the, the cubes are essentially, I, you know, I could show you the code if you cared. But uh, I wrote little components to spin them, little components to change the color whenever they're touched by this cursor at the center thing. It's really uh, simple. Um, we can do computer vision. So there's a view, standard Vuforia target if you've ever seen it. And we can go in and look around and you know, do, our, do our Vuforia stuff. Um, and we can also uh, do planetary scale stuff. So I can look around and hopefully I will see things. So uh, these place marks are actually located correctly geospatially. So that thing is hundreds of kilometers tall uh, at London, very far away, 8,000 8, kilometers. Um, Georgia Tech uh, is that way. It's about 3,300 3, 3, uh, 3,300 kilometers in that direction. The interesting part here, aside from the fact that you know I can put ugly place marks, is um, we've already started to work on this notion of separating reality from the app. So assuming this loads, which it did a few minutes ago, um, I loaded up a panorama-based reality that should be loading a panorama, come on web, uh, of uh, uh, an area near Georgia Tech. and if I look around, the place marks have all moved, and there is, and the Georgia Tech place mark now says it's about 1.3 kilometers away, um, because the reality is providing the location to the browser, not the browser's GPS necessarily. And so we can start having web experiences that, uh, that you could deploy, say, on the desktop, and people could access and view remotely as if they were there. I'm going to flip back once and go forward again just to see if that loads. That doesn't matter. OK, so, um, and so Argon supports other browsers. Argon JS supports other browsers. So there's that same panorama demo running a normal web page, which I won't go into. So those demos that you saw were all A-frame bits of code. This, this uh, presentation is available on the web if you, you want to go look at it. But that's the box that you saw. Um, oops, Lord, I touched the bottom of the screen where the navigation bar is. OK. Um, and we're almost done. So there's, uh, so everything is done with A-frame uh, as well, which means uh, we can uh, 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 mix and match those things. We've adopted, it's actually really important when you think about doing AR on the web or anywhere to sort of think deeply about how you attach content to the world. If you've used HoloLens or programmed on it, you know that you have to attach all content to web anchors. Um, it, or to anchors in the world. You can't just toss stuff out there. So we've adopted a similar model. So in Argon, everything has to be attached to some sort of frame, as you can see. It's either marker, a geospatial location, and so on. Okay. So uh, it's a similar model, uh, actually, to HoloLens. So the web is cool, right? So this is sort of the message of this talk. We can do VR. We can do AR now. We're doing things like working with the folks, uh, a company called Track Labs, to do extend a maintenance, the maintenance system they make for the ISS uh, to support AR. Um, we can leverage cool web tools like glitch.com. If you haven't ever used Glitch, um, it's worth checking out. It's basically uh, an online free, it's like the Google Docs of doing uh, web programming, for lack of a better way to say it. It's amazing. Um, and, uh, and so on. So uh, I always end with a Tony Stark picture because I have fantasies. Uh, so um, it's my go-to Halloween costume. I have a very nice beard. Um, so the web really, as I said early on uh, in the talk, it, it is the metaverse. It's here. We think of it as this 2D thing. But there is this opportunity, this potential to use web IR, to use web VR, and to create and to think about what are the services we need to create to, to really just enable the web to be 3D and, and create this stuff all around us. And I think that is actually a really uh, exciting possibility. So I will shut up after that. Thank you. And so up next we have Sean, who gets to follow that uh, live demo and coolness. So uh, thanks, as the expression says, for eating your own dog food and yeah, uh, showing uh, something working. I have a, I have the rest zero. of this will we'll blow through, because um, I think between the two of us we have four slides, and then we're going to open this up to panel. Yep. Cool. Hey, uh, my name's Sean. 
I will go through this as quickly as possible. I've got very few slides and very little demos. But I run a creative web studio in London, in the UK. And we created the studio two years ago to develop uh, web products for people. So people would come to us with their ideas. They didn't have anyone to build them for them, and we would help them build them. Uh, we did that for a little while, and in 2016, um, I saw uh, a demo of WebVR, and I said to my co-founder, yeah, we should do this. We should take all the money that we've just saved and uh, <laughs> spend it on really expensive equipment and office and do something that isn't supported in any browser at the moment. And he said, yeah, OK. Uh, <laughs> so we decided to do that. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a bit crazy. And the reason we did that is because We've both been developing for the web for a combined of like 30 years. I'm not that old. He is. Uh, <laughs> and we both love the web and what it represents in terms of like the openness and uh, all the standards and things like that. And we went through the phase of web versus mobile. We both worked at uh, an agency where we were consis consistently pitted against the mobile t uh, native mobile team to build a better app than they could build. And we were just like, we don't have to because we're on the web. We can just use things that you, you know, they were already they were already asking us to build web views for their apps. So it's like, why do you why do you why do, why do you even contest it? And I think we we now realize we kind of won that competition, even though we left the agency, because uh, not many people were installing apps nowadays. And so when I saw web VR and thought about, you know, what what VR could be and uh, what it could achieve eventually. Um, I don't really see it existing anywhere sensible, with the exception of AAA games and things like that, on an app store. I don't see people downloading apps for the Space Jam 2 VR experience. I definitely would go to the website, though. Um, so it's things like that that led me to want to do VR on the web and really support that. So. Yeah, we wanted to we wanted to web VR. We thought we were going to have a really hard sell, but it turns out um, we didn't really. Uh, we were about three days in the office um, when we first set up, and a company came to us and they saw one of our demos, which was a really basic 360 experience. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't interactive much. It played a video and had some really nice images. And they said, "Can you build us an editor where people who have no idea what web VR is can build these really basic experiences. And we said, yeah, OK. So that's one of the projects that we're working on. Um, it's We're taking all the stuff that we know about the web and love about the web, and we can build a full stack that just exports uh, a really nice mini VR experience, or what we call snackable VR. Um, we don't think that people are, every everyday people are going to spend sort of 20, 30 minutes in VR. We think that it's really going to be consumed in these small, snackable experiences. Uh, we're really big fans of um, education and uh, and training. And we've been doing a little bit of work with a company called LearnBright, who already had a uh, 3D training uh, sort of like simulators, but like Second, uh, second Life. But uh, it was already living in sort of like 3D web, and they want to move over to use web VR. So we've been doing some work with them and helping them move that over. Uh, one of the things that um, I'm, I don't know if the video is going to play on this. Hey, it will. Uh, I got kind of excited about was using other web technologies. So using AWS uh, server, uh, the P2 grid stuff to, to do really complicated uh, sort of biotech calculations. I'm happy to talk about any, like this goes really deep, but um, it's basically calculating binding sites for proteins, um, but using AWS for the calculation, not using it in the browser, and just using the browser for displaying the content. And we want to be able to move this into, the idea is, is like tilt brush, but for biotech drug designing, which is kind of cool. And another company we're working for to do medical education. Um, really basic explanation videos on how drugs interact with the body. And the company that we're working with doesn't want to send out loads of different video links anytime they have to update it about the drug. They want to be able to use links to external documentation. And so we built them a set of tools that can 
they can put together these really quick uh, web VR mini experiences and send those links out to the pharmacies that order these new drugs. And if they need to update at any time, the link just gets updated and the next time that they go on there, it's just the new experience. So we get to use a lot of the new technologies and I mean, generally I'm really excited about things like all the stuff that the Kronos group is doing um, with the stuff that's going to support WebVR. All the stuff that was recently announced at Google I.O., there was something like 240 new APIs and for me they're just, just like, okay, they're all open now to be used in WebVR. Things like the payment gateway, um, the stuff that Samsung's done with adding uh, payments to, to the web, so it's really nice and easily to integrate and things like that. Uh, background processing, there's tons of stuff I could geek out about and happily speak to anyone who wants to hear me talk about how we uh, really build the metaverse because the metaverse isn't going to exist in the app store. It's just people aren't going to do it. I don't think people are going to download, uh, download apps for every single experience. And I want to see the weird stuff in VR, and I don't think that's going to be on the on our app store either. Just like the weird David Lynch, Twin Peaks types of the VR experiences. Yeah, the cage in cage uh, is, uh, I'll happily show anyone that. That's just little tiny VR experiences, and they'll all live on the web. And yeah, the metaverse isn't going to live in an app store. Anyone who thinks it is, is deluded. Uh, for uh, giving us a rundown from what you guys are doing on that side of the pond. And to give everybody a chance to chat, it looks like we will hear from our friends over at uh, Sketchfab after all. Uh, exactly. I think the term is FOMO. No, I'm kidding. Can I just, yeah. Just want to run the browser and the screen. Oh, there it is. Okay, it's very tiny. Um, hi guys, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Sketchfab, and I just wanted to. It's cool to talk about Sketchfab, but it's really better to show Sketchfab because it's very visual and, and graphical. Uh, so just wanted to give a very high-level uh, overview of what it is and and what it does, and then just uh, go through um, a few cool examples. So we started Sketchfab back in uh, 2012, and the idea was that whenever you create content, you need to be able to publish it and share it uh, on the internet. And if it's a video, you're going to share it on YouTube, a sound on SoundCloud, a slide on SlideShare. And there was no platform to host uh, 3D content, and so we went on to create the first and the best platform to publish, share, embed 3D files on the web. The cool thing is that since 2012, 3D creation has been uh, really democratized and now it's really becoming mainstream with easier creation tools like Minecraft or Tilbrush, which means that five-year-old kids can do 3D doodles in the air. And most importantly, 3D capture coming to our smartphones with devices like Google Tango. If you look at the evolution of capture, we started with painting and then we got photography and then we got video, but we live in a 3D world and we keep getting closer and closer to what the world looks like in terms of capture. And with 3D capture coming to our smartphones, everyone will, will be able to capture the world in 3D. And so Sketchfab is uh, the platform where you, where you can publish uh, this type of content. We are a, a community of almost 1 million members. I've published more than 1.5 million 3D scenes. Everything that's published on the platform is viewable on the web, of course, but also in VR, straight from any Sketchfab URL, any embed. I'm just going to show you a few examples. Um, so here I have uh, a, a collection of some of my uh, favorite Sketchfab uh, models. Here's a pretty cool example. So it's very diverse. Uh, I don't know if it's a metaverse, but you can really find a virtual version of pretty much anything, uh, any organ typically. So we support animated content and you can open the viewer in VR uh, straight from the web. We have people recreating uh, cartoons in 3D. So this is really uh, pretty amazing. This is a Calvin and Hobbes stripe all recreated in 3D and then hosted on the web in Sketchfab and then with web VR you can jump into this cartoon in with six degrees of freedom uh, with any headset, Vive, Oculus, uh, Daydream, Gear VR. That's pretty cool. 
And then we have typically a lot of museums publishing art on the platform. Here is the channel of the British Museum. Uh, they, they digitize a lot of their content, and you can just browse through any model on the web. And then you can open the, the Sketchfab channel of the British Museum in web VR, and so browse through their entire collection. Uh, so our VR browser is going to open uh, a VR wall of things, and you can just uh, jump into any of the scenes um, in VR. And so it's kind of just dive into a given scene uh, with six degrees of freedom again, and then you can exit it and go back to another scene. And just just wanted to show a few examples of uh, embeds as well. So we are the only volumetric player supported in the Facebook newsfeed. Uh, so here is an example of Adidas using our player in their Facebook newsfeed to show a 3D version of their uh, latest uh, soccer sneakers. And so here again, so that's our player running in the newsfeed, uh, fully volumetric, uh, very high res, and you can see the, the so it's still loading the textures. You can see the the shoe in uh, full 3D glory uh, with physically based rendering and, and nice uh, lighting and shadow. And again, you can open it in in VR straight from the Facebook post. And tomorrow in AR with Web AR, you'd be running the 2D web and then bring this shoe as an hologram. Uh, with your headset straight from the web. That's really the, the beauty and the promise of, of web VR and web AR. And then just a last example uh, with Porsche, a project that we just did with them uh, for the launch of the latest uh, Panamera car. And so that's our player uh, running in the Porsche uh, website. Again, like you have full uh, volumetric freedom. A lot of the car stuff you see is going to be like 360. And here it's really like a virtual version of the car hosted on the web. Um, it's all animated, so you can act actually uh, open and close the doors, which is pretty cool. And again, like jump into it in VR or AR straight from uh, this web page. So that's it for uh, Sketchfab, and I give the mic back to Damon. And then um, I will be super quick um, as well so we can get to the at least 15 minutes of the panel, since our professor took up so much time. Um, hey, no, that's fair, that's fair. Um, okay, so I was supposed to jump up here and talk about what's next, but when it really comes to building um, you know, the web, and, and I think the fun thing about VR and AR is that that's pretty much everything. So I'm gonna focus a little bit more on um, what my background comes from and my interest and look there. So. Um, what I see is next, uh, so the, uh, I've spent a lot of time looking at essentially the digitization of the built environment. So um, those that know me know that I'm very much about open standards for 3D data on the web. Uh, I focus also on enterprise, so I don't believe in entertainment. It's fun to entertain me. Um, but when it comes to how do we use these technologies in multi-trillion dollar markets, right, that's a much bigger thing. And so for there, it's not, for me, I always look at these technologies as it's not about a VR app. It is about VR as a feature, because you have many different stakeholders who have to collaborate on data, and they need to do that across different disciplines, familiarity levels with technology, and different context. So AR is great for one person on the field, but they need to collaborate with someone in the browser back in the office. So, so what I look at is, is really, um, you know, the, the, as the digital world comes on around us, and so that's what's kind of fun for why at Samsung, um, for those that don't know, uh, Samsung has an internet browser. And, and what's fun about this for me is, is coming from as the web begins to connect and we use the browsers not just to look at information in the web and the internet, but to communicate with the actual built environment around us. And what I mean by built environment is everything that's man-made. As you begin to use the web to control your car, your house, your building, uh, talk with your doctor, right? There are certain of these permissions and things and the applications need to go beyond the security levels. As which was quickly talked into, if your kid is playing a game that's uh, HoloLens and you bring him to work, but you're a senator, he's now mapping the inside of a federal building, okay? So there are a lot of these things to where the real world comes into play about where that data is stored and the permissions. And so that's what's fun about the devices is you can leverage some of the additional parts as a browser that works with the device with the biometric integration, right? If you're doing a, a web medical application that has a VR component or a medical AR component, then you can fall within HIPAA compliance because that doctor is the person who's supposed to be looking at your medical records as authenticated by the device. If the person who turned off the fire alarm for this 
was the actual facilities manager, right? So, so I look at it um, from what's next is, is how do we look at, as was brought up, um, you know, web payments, right? That's a key thing. Who's going to buy an app in this day and age for web when all the mobile apps are given away for free? And that's what people are used to now. So how do you have those transaction inside? Um, so very much one about web payments as an integration. Also, uh, as I said, as more enterprise picks this up, we have to look at those things of authentication, right? That person is a person that they say they are because of securities, permissions, uh, legal responsibilities. And then also the ability of looking at, you know, again, how do we use many different visualization mechanisms? So just a real quick, you know, little plug for Samsung. You know, it was the first VR headset to have an internet browser, and it was the first one to support web VR back in 2016 of April. And then what's neat is that it's also the same device that works on the phone, the new TVs, the tablets, and also with the wearables. So what I would like to see what's next is, is I want to see more web developers that aren't just building a web VR application. How are you building applications that work on mobile, tablet, desktop, and then have this web VR feature? So if I always come to your website on the mobile device or the tablet, and I have to learn that UI UX, that now when I got my gear because I upgraded to my S8 or whatever, I understand how that goes. And so no one's doing that. So that's what I'd like to see what's next. And I see what's next as these things come into enterprise. So with that, I'll go ahead and um, jump off. And we'll go over to uh, panel time. So um, I have, of course, a question uh, to ask someone here. Um, but I'd like to open it up for anyone in the audience. Yes, sir. Uh, does uh, Sketchfab play nice with uh, GL, uh, GL? Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we added uh, GLTF support, I think, right in time for GDC, so like a few months ago. Uh, we typically use it to let you publish scenes from uh, Unity to Sketchfab, for example, example and it's going to support like PBR uh, materials and animations uh, thanks to GLTF. Yes, it does work today within Facebook. Yes, Mike. Uh, so when is, uh, whenever you have massive multiplayer experiences in VR and AR especially, um, and some, some browsers are implementing UDP, uh, user data ground protocol, like Allspace and JSVR. When, when can we have that with Mozilla in Samsung? Whenever someone builds it. Um, I mean, essentially, what. So the question was when are we going to have massively multiplayer web experiences? I mean, I think the. You know, and you mentioned that some, some people are building in UDP and, and leveraging it. The, Networking is just hard. I mean, I'll just say it that way. Um, we are looking at, there's people who, if you go to the A-Frame website, there's people who are doing experiments integrating, uh, you know, Firebase and other kinds of backends, the kinds of backends that people use for large-scale games into, uh, into things like WebVR and A-Frame. Um, tons of people interested in it. Uh, it's just, the big question is, how do, what is the sweet spot? Um, I actually don't. So I'll, I'll answer it by saying I don't think we'll see massively multiplayer web experiences. What I actually think we'll see is uh, massively tiny multi-person experiences, like three people, right? But I, I actually don't want, I don't want um, to have uh, Second Life implemented on the web. What I want is I put up a model uh, on Sketchfab, and I'm looking at it. And I invite you with a message to go look at it, and you're somewhere on the other side of the country, and your avatar appears beside me, yeah. and we can talk about it, look at it, point at it, and that could be hosted peer to peer within a website, and that's the kind of thing that I actually think the web will excel at. Um, I'm not, I, I, I mean, I can't speak for Mozilla I, I'm in this this one, but I don't, I don't think uh, massive multiplayer via the web, except insofar as there's a back end that's generating and managing this, and you're using the web as a display engine. I don't know if that answers your question, but I've seen there's a there's a Samsung demo that Ada did. Yeah, Ada. That had uh, 200, 200 people. Was it two hundred? Sure. <laughs> it was a lot of people. It was at least it was. It was at least. Well, go with it. Go I think there was people online as well who were live. Yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. was, I think there was about. I've seen two hundred. I've seen. Two, yeah, yeah, no, and no yeah. stuff. I mean, <coughs> you can do small scale yeah. like a couple of hundred with Socket IO as long as you're exactly. not sending too much yeah. data. The problem is if you're talking, so I've done, I, I wrote a little polling thing when I was teaching so my class of 200 could, could do polling with Socket.io. It's simple. The problem with the web is if you're sending head, hand, object, 
60 frames per second, 90 frames per second, like if you do it dumb, if you do, do the obvious thing, you're going to flood the network with a few people. So it, the mass of multiplayer tends to be application specific, and so that's just hard to do. I think some of the new APIs like background workers and stuff will help with well, It helps, but you just flood the network, right? I mean, at, at 60 hertz, if I, if I've got 200 people, someone with a calculator could do the computation, <laughs> right? If you got 90 hertz on a, on a Vive, 200 people, how many bytes in a head, a hand, a whatever, and everybody is sending to everybody or it's right. all going up, it's all shared ether. Yeah. It's going to flood it. It's all about the application as well. Yeah. It really depends. One more. Yep. Microsoft, Google, and O2 are talking about streaming light fields, the very best GPU rendered, multi GPU rendered graphics over networks to AR glasses. Um, is, that, is this coming to web AR and web VR? Is this something that you're thinking about and talking about? And what do you guys think about it? Is high level graphics coming to web AR, web VR? For those Via people? streaming? Via streaming. I've seen people talking about it, but I don't know anything about plans within within Mars for it. People like to talk. Yeah. Yeah. So um, then, then I have a question um, for Sketchfab, Alan, because I know that uh, a lot of people ask me, you know, um, they say that business-wise, WebVR is very tough to build as, as a company, as, as a service. Um, how have you, like, what are some of the challenges that you've run into being one of these early adopters of something that still is kind of an experimental API? I think that for us, one of the important things is that we're not VR or web VR only, and so most of our traffic is still on the regular web. And so I think it's really great to have this as a feature we can offer uh, to our uh, users and partners, and web VR and VR is the best way to experience this content, uh, but not the only way. Um, so for us, it's just uh, yeah, one additional screen that is the best screen. Typically, I think, VR consumption is maybe 1% of our consumption. We have 6 million unique visitors on the web, and it's going to take time to get this rich in VR. But the engagement and the time spent in VR is like 10x uh, higher. And so it's just you know a, a trade-off, like you have um, a much smaller reach, but a much better uh, engagement and, and experience. Okay, so um, we'll turn it. Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't see you in the mic. Go ahead. Uh, question There's a Google project, Draco, which does 3D model compression. It's supposedly to help uh, the VR, AR on the web transmit these models that are large. Does that offer any help at all, or is that just a, a kind of a toy? No, it's not a toy. It's, it's really good work. And uh, it's not the only place they can deploy it, but they are working with Kronos to put it as an extension into GLTF. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, essentially anything that, that reduces the amount of data you're sending over the wire is awesome, yeah. right? And I mean, even for the video streaming stuff that, uh, that you asked, it's like, there's a trade-off, right? Rendering, getting all that data down to render it in the client, it has to get down somehow. And at some point, if you can, if, if it's less, less bandwidth to stream a rendered uh, rendered thing down, it, it, in certain situations it'll be good. So. And typically the bulk of the 3D content is going to come from 3D capture and photogrammetry and this is very polygon in intensive but doesn't need a very, like, it supports like decimation pretty well and so Draco is really helpful for that kind of data. Thank you. I mean, the other things we're thinking of putting into GLTF, now GLTF2 is almost done, is um, textures. There's some, a basis is a company that has some cool textured technology that uh, can be transmitted very efficiently. Then it expands on client to the GPU native uh, texture that can be handled very efficiently. And that's done at very high quality and low, low bandwidth. So that's another cool, cool piece. I was actually talking to some folks during the fire alarm. The, other, the next thing might be something like point clouds. I mean, that, that's actually transmitting point clouds would be good for some applications. That's the kinds of things we're thinking about with GLTF next. Because it's just solving one part very low down in the stack. So all of the um, runtimes, all the OpenXR doesn't replace the VR runtimes, the Oculus, the Daydream, the, the Samsung stuff. They will all continue to exist. OpenXR is just a set of APIs that those runtimes can choose to expose to get access to more devices and to more applications. 
And WebVR is one of those engines that needs access to all of those devices and those engines. And so we can reduce the amount of porting work that WebVR will need to do to access all those different devices and runtimes. So uh, it doesn't replace WebVR, uh, but it hopefully it, and it's only one problem that WebVR is having to solve, but it, it is a pretty nasty problem, so we hope we can reduce the amount of work they have to do. Yeah, I mean, you can go and look in the Firefox source, and there's, you know, three implementations of WebVR, or three things that they talk to inside right now, and those are three things you had to implement. If we could just point at one thing, that's a ton of work saved. And so, um, in, in conclusion, um, I would ask uh, the panelists, um, just one or two sentences, what would you like for the audience to take away from this crazy uh, part, uh, this crazy presentation today? What would you like for uh, folks to walk away with? Well, I think that a few people have said it, but I agree. The metaverse is the web. And, but as we implement, and I'm coming from the technology point of view, as we implement that metaverse using the web, it's multiple layers of software going to need to work together over hardware. Everything's got to work together. AR is the dream or the nightmare application, and everything has to work together. So, but we're making good progress. Uh, yeah, fuck Apple. <laughs> <laughs> Here, you can throw this across the room. Yeah. <laughs> they right. just make so, everything so hard on the web. Uh, and there, is there anyone here from Apple? No. Not that they can. They're going to make care. Hand after that. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's my. F I, I, I really don't like proprietary stuff. I don't like silos. Um, I don't like that people think that. You know, you can't make money on the web, or you can't make something profitable on the web. You can, if you want to ask me why or the, how, I'll happily speak to you afterwards. All right. Um, I'd say WebVR is easier than what you may think or what it may sound like. Uh, the browser it's, is more powerful than what you may think. And the, the potential uh, is much bigger than the credit it gets today. <laughs> I was going to say that. No, um, <laughs> no, actually. Um, so I'll actually take the op opposite uh, stance. Um, I actually think I would like to sort of, in a sense, issue a call to action that um, thing, there was silos before VR and AR, right? I mean, Apple is a silo. Google is a, is a stealth silo, right? Um, Facebook is a silo. Everybody's a silo. And the silos that are bigger, stronger, faster, better when it comes to AR and VR. I mean, the amount of, of work that is required to build SLAM software at Facebook, at Microsoft, at Google is unbelievable. And if we don't make this work, the web could go away, right, um, as we know it. Because everything is going to be out on, uh, is gonna, people are going to be pushing away from even these horrible devices to this stuff, and if the only way you can access the world is through Facebook or through Google or through whatever Apple introduces next week, um, then that actually will, will suck a lot. Um, and I mean, not just, I mean, a few people commented on, you know, it's the crazy stuff that we like on the web, right? It's, it's the cage and cage, if you haven't, just Google cage and cage and get a vibe. Um, it's basically a bunch of Nicolas Cage movies playing simultaneously around you while you're in a cage. Um, and is that, is that valuable culturally redeeming? No, but it's awesome. Um, and, and if you think about, but then if you take more seriously stuff like, I, you know, I built, a student of mine built a game to teach proper condom use to middle school kids because she felt passionately about this. She'd worked at the CDC. No chance that, that would ever get published on the App Store, right? Yeah. Condoms, kids, sex, ah. and and so that stuff's all going to go away, right? It's Big Brother time. So uh, uh, get involved, try to figure out how to make the web work in this new new era, um, because uh, the stakes are a lot bigger than they were in the past. Well, and on that note, a round of applause for an amazing panel and an unforgettable session. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. It's a pleasure.